social movements, I think thankfully for all of us, have shaped the world we live in for a long time. Not more was that evident than in the disruptive 60s. We talked yesterday about how there the mantra was that you should trust no one over 30. It was the time of protest, it was the time of sit-ins, it was the time of teach-ins, and that was the time when the St. Gallen Symposium and the International Students Committee was founded. But I don't know how you feel. When I look at these students, and they're Hugo Boss, and I think this is a long way from a sit-in. <laughs> so uh, can you give us a little bit of a history lesson, Leo, on how we got from the 60s to you professional students of today? Sure, I can. <laughs> yeah, over 50 years ago now, five students sat together, and one of them is actually sitting here in our third row, if I'm seeing that correctly with the light here. And these five students sat together and decided that the social debate at that time, students being on the streets, rioting, but decision makers being only in their offices, being far, far out of reach, that the social debate at that time needed a bridge, a bridge between generations. And this bridge got established, and um, therefore they initiated the first St. Gallen Symposium here on campus. And it's, uh, as, I, as I already mentioned yesterday, it is a very long time for a student initiative. And here we are, it is 2023, and uh, our debates, our social debates are more important than ever, and therefore this cross-generational dialogue is being needed. Well, it's grown up a lot. It's gotten extremely professionalized as somebody who's been here now for the second <laughs> year. But that says nothing uh, about how we don't constantly need to be challenged asking ourselves the difficult questions. And whether you're doing it in fine tailoring or on the streets and sit-ins, I don't think that matters. It matters that the questions get asked. Uh, so in our next conversation, which I'm really looking forward to, we're going to reflect a little bit on how advocacy has changed uh, over time. Uh, particularly in these last few years. You think about Black Lives Matter, a decentralized organization that really began to push the questions on equity, on race in my other native country, the United States. But they did it in a really different way. They were connected through data. They planned uh, in a way uh, that was uh, disaggregated but connected. And so we're looking forward to hearing uh, how that's possible and how you sustain an organization over time. And I think it's fundamentally fascinating how now student organizations, advocacy organizations, are able to use the tools of every day to find different ways of financing themselves and getting the message out. And I think personally, of course, particularly around and uh, about the really brave women in Iran who have not only been brave in their own streets, but they have found means and ways of sharing their stories with us through social media, through film, and through their own, again, their voice. Uh, and you'll see again and meet again Vanessa Nakate, the 2022 Global Goalkeeper Award winner, uh, brave and forthright activist for sustainability in her native Uganda and the world. So I'm really looking forward to this session, and uh, Leo's going to lead us into the conversation. Yes. So this session will explore the choices and challenges facing social movements today, continuing the tradition of the dialogue here of the St. Gallen Symposium. And I'm welcoming to the stage our topic leader, Veit Dengler, who is a, the former CEO of NZZ um, and the founder of Broad Solutions, and Ayo Tometi, who is the co-founder of the Black Lives Matter movement and who is a human rights and social justice advocate. And as we already mentioned, Vanessa Nakate, a climate justice advocate. Welcome to the stage. Good afternoon, everybody, to this session titled How Change Happens. And I think we have an excellent podium uh, to explain to us how it actually does happen. 
Um, the subtitle is Social Movements Between Parliaments and Protests, and I think that's something we'll explore now, next hour. So um, Ayo Tomete, we welcome. Uh, she's a co-founder of Black Lives Matter, as we heard. She was also the executive director of the Black Alliance for Just Immigration, and she now consults businesses on, and NGOs on issues such as human rights or um, impact investing. Yes. And to my left is Vanessa Nak Nakate from Uganda. She's the founder of the Rise Up Climate Movement. She has won many prizes and accolades, including recently being named the UNICEF Goodwill Ambassador. Um, she lives in Kampala. I don't usually mention the age of participants when I do things like that. In this case, I'll make an exception, if you <laughs> permit. Um, you're 38 and 26, so um, I think the generational aspect is quite important. Of course, I'm old enough to remember when the Wright brothers first flew their airplane. Um, so I think it'll be a nice uh, opportunity to explore uh, generational issues around social change. Now, Vanessa, I'd like to start with you. Five years ago, you were studying business administration in Kampala, as you mentioned. And you know, now you are a UNICEF ambassador. You travel all over the world for um, advocacy. Can you tell us a little bit about how you first got started in advocacy and how you built up Rise Up? Well, thank you so much. So in 2018, I started to carry out research about some of the challenges that the people in Uganda were facing. And at that time, I got to learn that climate change was one of those challenges. Of course, I had heard about climate change in school, specifically in geography class um, in high school, but then I didn't really carry the reality of what was happening on the ground. I carried more of the theory, and what I remember learning in school didn't really make me feel like it was an urgent issue. But in my research, I got to see that uh, climate change was already impacting different parts of Uganda, to be specific, the eastern part of Uganda in areas of Bududa, Bundibujo, with flooding and landslides. And in that moment, I decided that I would uh, start striking or I would do something about it. And I think at that time, in 2018, we were seeing the Fridays for Future movement that was started by Greta from Sweden. And I really felt inspired by what she was doing. So I made a decision to also start striking in 2018. However, it actually took me a while to do the very first climate strike because I was very scared, very nervous, and also very shy to face the public. But I remember in 2019, uh, the first week of January, I felt this urgency in my heart and in, in my spirit that the climate crisis was you know, affecting people so much and I had to do something about it. So I decided to hold my very first strike with my cousins and siblings. It's Fridays you know, for future, so the strike should be on Friday. However, the urgency, I remember getting it on a Saturday evening, and I decided to hold my very first strike on Sunday because I felt like I needed to do something. And it's in that time that I started to strike. And then the following weeks, I would do it every Friday. We started reaching out to schools uh, to carry out climate education, as it was very hard for us to hold big strikes uh, on the streets. And along this journey, I remember founding a Youth for Future that was you know, working with fellow um, students, my friends from university, to create awareness about the climate crisis. And from that, Rise Up movement was birthed. But the main focus of Rise Up movement was to help raise, uh, to help amplify the voices of different activists across the African continent because we saw how there was a challenge that many activists were facing in having their voices listened to. And what we've done with Rise Up is to find platforms, either conferences or webinars or media opportunities to ensure that the stories and the experiences of those on the front lines of the climate crisis are listened to. How do we imagine Rise Up? Is it like an organization with an office and a couple of employees, or, or is it 
volunteers in their spare time? Well, I mean, honestly, for the time that Rise Up has been existent, it's been uh, mostly in volunteering of different, um, you know, youth activists in Uganda and different activists across Africa. So there is no office. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. Ayo, I'd like to go to you. Obviously, you became famous as the founder of Black Lives Matter. Um, and from afar, it looked like it became huge immediately out of nowhere. Yeah. How did it actually get started? <laughs> tell, us, tell us the inside story. Yeah, well, first of all, I'm so grateful to be here, grateful to be sitting next to Vanessa. I am such a huge fan and admirer of you and your work. And I don't take it lightly that we're in conversation as Africans, um, me in the diaspora, but like as, as people who are committed to humanity and dignity and getting to share the stage with you is such an honor. Thank you. So, um, you're right, <laughs> right, you're right. So, uh, a lot of people have come to know me and my work through Black Lives Matter, knowing that I'm a co-creator of Black Lives Matter. However, I have been involved in social justice movements for a long time, and, um, and even in advocacy organizations since I was quite young. I remember the first, you know, iterances of my work was working with my youth group in high school and organizing them to volunteer with me at soup kitchens and working every Sunday, you know, volunteering and feeding the homeless and, and doing things like that. So I've been involved in some sort of service and support for some time, but it wasn't really until college and then even post-college that I got involved um, in social justice on a more regularized basis. And I want to make that distinction because I feel like it's important. Because in the beginning of my work, you know, I'm a Nigerian-American, born and raised in Phoenix, uh, Arizona. And that is, of course, the uh, border between US and Mexico. And so a lot of folks know us for being in that border region, know us for having, uh, be, being part of this like, national discourse around immigration and so on. And this is where I was born. This is my, this is my hometown. And I got involved as an activist around immigration issues while I was in high school. Sorry, no, while I was in college. Although in high school, I remember one of my best friends, her mom was in immigration detention and was deported. And so from an intimate level, I knew that people in my community were also being impacted by immigration enforcement. And people who were doing their best to keep their families together and provide for their families were also being impacted by immigration. And you know, while I was in college, I came across a number of different organizations and groups and individuals who were involved in immigration struggles. And I realized that we were having a lot of anti-immigrant laws that were being passed. And Arizona was being kind of seated as a testing ground for the anti-immigrant movement. And with that, with these immigration laws and policies that were being pushed and, and passed, it was clear that we couldn't just take one action at one time. We needed to be part of a longer term struggle, um, a longer set of actions, and engaged in organizations that were deeply committed to transforming our society and to ensuring the rights and liberties for, for immigrants and their allies and, and just people of color, period. And so I got involved. <laughs> I got involved. Um, I was doing a lot of communications work for immigrant rights organizations. I was helping a coalition of migrant justice advocates and got involved there. And then um, during one of the largest rallies that we ever had, we had almost, I guess, like we had almost 100,000 people who were out in the streets in Arizona. People from around the world converged there. I met a group of black people who had come in from Oakland, California. They brought in a group of ministers, civil rights leaders, and so on. And they really understood that the struggle for immigrant rights was intimately interlinked with the struggle for racial justice. And I knew that firsthand just by virtue of being black in the United States. I knew how racialized the immigration system was, and I knew that the immigration enforcement was so linked to the criminal justice system. And so it was clear to me that this, these things were happening and they were impacting black people most acutely. Um, and so I was really heartened to meet these people, and they hired me uh, after a while of volunteering with them. They decided, hey, you know what? You're, you're really great. You're doing this really great work. We want you to come and work with us. And so 
I became their national organizer and communications director. I traveled around the United States working with black communities, uh, working with African Americans, one, to understand how the immigrant Uh, the anti-immigrant movement was also impacting them, as well as working with black immigrants and refugees to understand how their unique needs um, were, and ch unique needs and challenges uh, within the immigration system. And it was, I mean, it was a lot of work. <laughs> I did that for about 10 years. Um, and I moved to New York and was mobilizing that network of hundreds of other organizations and hundreds of other individuals across the nation who were looking to transform immigration policy to make it more fair and just and acknowledging our human dignity. So then give us the bridge to Black Lives Matter and how that suddenly popped. Oh, okay. So the bridge to Black Lives Matter is, is, is quite simple. So Many of us, so the three co-founders, let me just start there. The three co-creators of Black Lives Matter were already community organizers, right? We were already invested in our communities, already doing the work. But as people who care about what's going on in our society, we too, just like everybody else, are watching the news, watching court cases, watching different things unfold. And we all saw that when Trayvon Martin was killed by George Zimmerman, We heard the story. We saw that George Zimmerman was on trial for the murder, for its murdering Trayvon Martin. And we were all astonished and outraged that he was acquitted, right? So somebody who literally stalked and killed a 17-year-old child was let go, let go free. And I, I got to tell you, I was floored by it, in part because my, I have two younger brothers, one of which was 14 years old at the time, and I couldn't imagine him growing up in a time where he would hear this story and know that this was okay, because essentially the, the court system said that this was okay and like he was going to go free. And I just knew something else had to be done. You know, I just did not want that to be the end of the story. And so I just, like a number of people, was on social media, looking at social media, sharing my thoughts and so on, and saw that Elisa Garza wrote a Facebook message. And in it, it read kind of like a love note to Black people, and it said something like, you know, Black people, I love us. Our lives matter. And then Patrice Cullors, her friend, who, was, who I didn't know at the time, but did a hashtag within it, um, underneath it, on Facebook. And I saw it, and I'm just like... I don't know, something in my spirit just hit me. And I called Alicia and said, hey, I don't know what you all are thinking or what's planned. I said this thing, Black Lives Matter, and I'm seeing something and I'm feeling something in my spirit and I'm already working with black people, but I know that in this moment, there needs to be something even more and we need to be organizing even, even more. This is a very significant uh, moment in history for us. And I can tell, and I can feel it in my spirit, this is a capital H history making moment. And what we do now is going to be of real consequence. And she was like, yes, I feel it too. We're all feeling it. So I bought blacklivesmatter.com, um, created a Facebook page and started a Twitter handle and just started inviting various black organizers that we already knew. We were already in community to some degree across the country and invited them to start using the same hashtag and essentially set up a Tumblr page and said, hey, We know that you're already working across the country. Why don't we tell people about what you're doing locally around racial justice and invite them to engage in this work? Because at this point, people are outraged, they're open, they're, you know, they want to get involved, they're all watching the news and they're all seeing that this man was found not guilty. And they're clear that if this could happen to Trayvon, this could happen to any of their children or cousins or uncles. And, They're also clear that this isn't just a one-off incident, right? So we know that there was a, um, an Eric Garner. We know about Oscar Grant in the past. We know about Amadou Diallo. We know about Tanisha McBride. We know about Renisha McBride. We know about all of these other people who've had and met similar fates, not only by vigilantes, but by security guards and police. And so it was clear that people needed to do something. They wanted to get involved and while we first started Black Lives Matter as a intercommunal 
within ourselves, speaking to Black people to remind ourselves of our inherent dignity and our worth. We knew with that clarity about who we are and about our sense of worthiness, we can go out into the world with, a, with, a, with strength and we could demand that our society change, demand that our society change and do right by our communities. And that was kind of that transition for myself. But like I said, it was much bigger, of course, than me. And as we've seen in recent years, and sadly with the murder of George Floyd, millions more have joined the movement. Yeah, and it went vir viral very fast, right? Yeah. So I think we both got a first impression of, of both of you and you know the amazing energy you have and the, the will to change something. I think a lot of social change just starts by a lot of people having the impact, the feeling that something needs to change, something needs to be done, right? I think sort of, but we're in a business school here, and you went to business school. Um, and what we are taught there is that if you want to do something, you have to set yourself targets and then adopt a strategy on how to get there. So I think the question I have, not just for your organizations, but also for yourselves, when you get out of bed or when you're exhausted sometimes from all the work you're doing, what are your targets? Like, what are you aiming for? How do you measure your impact that you're having? Well, I mean, when I started activism, of course, it was completely a new experience. And also, I think that is the time that the word activism ever got into the, vo the vocabulary that I knew at that time. Like, I I'd never thought about the existence of that word. So I think it was, it has been our journey of learning different things. Because even when I started, uh, you know, climate activism, I didn't know a lot um, that I know right now. You know, I just knew that there were floods and there were landslides and, you know, the changes in weather patterns. But I, I didn't know much about, you know, the impact of, uh, you know, the huge impact of the fossil fuel industry or uh, the fashion industry. Like, mm. everything was so new to me and many things I've learned, you know, um, on this journey, not just through reading, but also through fellow activists, through people that have, you know, gone ahead of us to kind of, you know, set that pattern for us to learn from. And I think it's still, even now I can't say that I know everything. I think it's still a journey of learning. And if I'm to, you know, talk about how I can see impact. I think for me, it goes back to what we are doing on the ground. Uh, for example, in Uganda, I started a project in 2019 and it involves the installation of solar panels and clean cooking stoves in schools in Uganda. And so far we've done installations in 45 schools and that has impacted about 17,000 children. And these are schools that, you know, for decades haven't had access to electricity. These are schools that use, you know, open fires to prepare food. So, and we know the challenges that come with all that. So for me to see uh, this grassroots project impacting uh, the lives of these children, the lives of teachers and the people who prepare the food for the children, especially uh, women, I think for me, that shows me that, um, you know, there is impact that I can see, um, impact that I can, you know, yeah, that I can see um, in, in the lives of these people. But I think even generally as a global movement, I think that there is so much impact that has come from the power of the people on the streets. Mm. Yeah. I have the same question to you because racism, I mean, it's been around for a while. Um, how do you measure progress or impact or, or, you know, objectives for you? Yeah, so I think this is such an interesting question. Um, and I feel like there's no one way to measure the impact. And it's something that my colleagues and I have actually been grappling with where we're like, what are the metrics? Like, what? And there's a lot of... You know, there's a lot of debate within our communities around like what the metrics should be. But what I would like to say is that our, our vision is big. 
Our vision is big because the need is that big, it's that profound. And with something like racism, right, and anti-Black racism to be specific, it's literally a global phenomenon. I mean, I don't even know if I don't the way to say it, but it, it really is that pervasive, and it is quite literally in the fabric of our society, and our global societies, just by virtue of how our, by the virtue of history, by the virtue of ex how our communities, our countries are intertwined, right? So when we look at the history of enslavement and the kidnapping of, of Africans and being brought to the West and being brought throughout the Americas and um, the disenfranchisement and the slavery and then you're, you're, you're free and then, you know, then there's Jim Crow and then there are all these other laws and all these other challenges. And then you're incarcerated and then your families are still ripped apart. So there are a myriad of challenges and the legacy um, of enslavement and what it's done not only to Africa, but to Africans in the diaspora, to black people around the world, has been profound. It's been, I mean, there's, there's no statistic or no data point where you don't see black people quite literally at the bottom, right? If we're talking about unemployment, if we're talking about education system and our outcomes, if we're talking about health disparities, um, if you just, I mean, literally, quite literally, I, moms giving birth, even if you are well-educated and have all this access, even in the United States, you are more likely to die than a poor white woman. There's just no amount of data, reports, stories that we haven't heard that continue to paint the exact same picture. And I just say that to remind us that the mandate is much bigger than any one of us, than any one organization, than any one industry or sector. Um, a lot of times I get invited into different conversations and you know, they, they want to relegate me to a criminal justice discussion uh, because of police brutality as being like the headline. But the truth is that we're talking about racism across the board. And we don't get to a point where a black person who has not committed any kind of crime, who is unarmed, can quite literally be choked to death in broad daylight, in the street, for everybody to see and be recorded, we don't get there unless there is a profound level of dehumanization of black people, period. Like, you don't just, this is, it's not normal. Like, I think everybody here could agree, like, this is not normal. It's not right. Maybe it's normal. Maybe it's some, to some degree in the U.S. It's, it's become normal, but it's not right. Yeah, of course. It's, we're morally bankrupt if this continues like this, right? To be in, with all the resources, with all the everything we have, for this to still be the status quo. And essentially, we've, be, we've said enough is enough. And we need, we're going to need metrics and efforts in every facet of our society. And what's moving to me and what's important now is that I believe we have that. Mm -hmm. What happened... I believe coming out, particularly these specific uprisings in 2020, in 2021, was that we've seen millions more people get involved. Not only in the US, but literally around the world. And people are getting involved in the business sector, they're getting involved in education, you have mental health workers, you have people all across the board who are quite literally transforming and challenging, like, first of all, they're challenging their sectors, they're challenging their workplaces, they're challenging their houses of worship, um, and they're saying, hey, we are also complicit. Our institutions are complicit if we do not grapple and deal with this scourge of racism in our sector, we're part of the problem that allows it to persist where black people could be killed in broad daylight with impunity. Lots of people will say that um, if you really want to change a society, you actually have to go into the mechanisms of how society is governed to change them. You have to go run for mayor and change the police, or you have to go run for Congress and change the laws. What makes you two both decide, you know, we want to do advocacy, we don't want to be part of the political process? Now, in Uganda, and I'll start with you, I don't exactly know the situation, I just know your president's been around for 37 years, so I'm not sure how hard or easy it is to get into the political uh, system and if you can actually change the things then. But have you had this thought for yourself, um, you know, should I be going into politics myself to change? Well, um, I think that, you know, just to follow up on what I said, 
that you know every sector is needed in order to address these challenges. It goes back to climate issues. And if I choose to be an activist, I think it's more of that is the platform I have chosen to create awareness about the impacts of the climate crisis. And if I chose to be maybe a teacher, I would use that to educate my students about you know the environment about you know basic human rights like access to food water and how these are being impacted by you know the changing weather patterns if i chose to be maybe a lawyer or a judge we see you know different court cases um are being are taken to court by activists you know, calling or holding fossil fuel companies accountable, holding governments accountable, um, I would use that place to support activists and ensure that they get the justice, you know, that they need. If I was, if I chose to be a journalist, I would use that space to, you know, to platform and amplify the voices of those on the front lines of the climate crisis. So I think it's really, understanding that in whatever you know place you find yourself you can still do something um, to ensure that the environment is protected i think that um, many people think that the responsibility of environmental protection is mainly on people who say that they are activists. But I think that it's a responsibility for all of us. Earth is a home to all of us. It's not just a home to climate activists. Earth is a home to you know, business leaders. Earth is a home to teachers. Earth is a home to you know, everyone. So you, you just find your part you know, in the movement, and then you do that part. I think, um, I think that is what you know, completes the puzzle. If I chose to maybe be in uh, politics, I think, again, using that part to ensure that you know, the environment is protected, I think that um, we all carry different distinctions. We all carry uh, different strengths, but if we put all those you know, strengths together, I believe we can achieve something. If you look at a puzzle, not every piece of the puzzle looks the same, but then the completion of that puzzle, you know, it's only possible if all the pieces are put together. So I think it's just realizing which part, um, you know, where you lie on that puzzle and then fitting in, you know, so that the whole puzzle is completed to ensure that we have a better future for all of us. Right. And what... Um, what about are you? Are you going to be Congresswoman Tomedi anytime soon? Or? <laughs> I don't think anytime soon, but okay. it's not out of the realm of possibility. Listen, I didn't ever know that I'd be here in Switzerland <laughs> speaking before you all. I was planning on engaging in some form of activism or community organizing in obscurity. Um, I don't think any of us engage in this type of work thinking we're going to become famous or anything like that. But I know that with the visibility, with the platform, with finally having a mic, I have a lot to say. <laughs> There's still a lot of work to do. Um, I'm very passionate about my community and very committed to seeing change in our societies. And so you, we'll, we'll see. Um, there is a history of community adv um, uh, advocates becoming president in the US, you know. <laughs> <laughs> now there is a precedent, right? There really is. Yeah. So who knows? But. Um, I'm, I'm open to the idea in the future, in the far out future. But for now, what I'm very committed to doing is supporting young leaders, um, equipping more people in different sectors, um, different industries, ensuring that they know how to get involved and what role that they can play and encouraging them, inspiring them, doing whatever I can to get them you know, geared up and involved in the struggle. I think what Vanessa was saying was absolutely right. And it reminded me of something Audrey Lord said. She said, uh, the late Audrey Lord, I hope folks know about her, really brilliant, beautiful feminist writer, said, there is no such thing as a single issued struggle. 
because we don't live single issue lives. And to me, that is so profound, it's so true. We are human beings, first and foremost. We are impacted by a myriad of things, and we should not have to contort ourselves or tear ourselves apart in order to feel like we can get involved in one um, organization or one issue. We can be involved in various organizations and various issues, and we should be, because we are impacted by all of these different things. Um, I think oftentimes about the climate justice work and the amazing work that you all are doing on the continent and how important it is for us to know that this, too, is an issue around racism, right? The ways in which climate change and, and global warming is impacting the world quite literally impacts Africa the worst, or most acutely, and the Caribbean. <laughs> These are places where you know, black people are, right? And we don't have the same amount of resources to, to withstand the devastation. Uh, we don't have the support, the visibility, the, and we're not the problem. <laughs> we're not the ones making the kind of damage um, that's causing the impact on us. And so it's very important that we get very real about the, the very real consequences, but we know that we can talk across different issues and we can exchange ideas and we link up and link these concerns and struggles and do what we can to have a more robust movement for more robust solutions. So let's get into one of the difficult issues around that. Uh, and I'll stay with the single issue of climate change because it's such a dominant issue. Um, uh, there was a survey done here um, for, the, for the symposium and they polled leaders of today and leaders of tomorrow. So leaders of today would be people my age and leaders of tomorrow would be students here. And when, the, when they were asked, the leaders of tomorrow were asked um, whether they agreed that measures uh, for the sustainable transformation of society and economy are more important than individual rights, 58% would say yes. And if you ask people my age, 2% would say yes. So quite a dis And if you look at the manifesto of the last generation that came out today, they say very clearly um, many things that we consider rights shouldn't be rights. Um, you know, you should be limited to one flight per year and you should be limited to 45 square meters or 450 square feet per person maximum, et cetera, et cetera. So this can become very real very quickly, right? This trade-off between you know, uh, limiting the impact of climate change versus individual rights. Where do you stand on that? Can you help rephrase the question? So people will, there will be uh, organizations such as Last Generation that will say, we have to limit individual rights and potentially quite severely in order to save the planet. Um, and then there would be others who would say, look, we have to find the solutions, technical solutions. We, yes, we have to find limits, but we have to do it in a way that allows us to live as free societies and people can still decide what they want to do within certain frameworks. And that's sort of the trade-off. I mean, Ayo, do you want to take it first? Where, where, where do you stand on that? I mean, I haven't seen that study, but I would love to see it. Um, my, my reaction is absolutely there has to be trade-offs. We, this, what we're doing, is not sustainable. It's not tenable. We're not going to, you know, future generations aren't going to inherit a world that is habitable, like truly habitable. It's not going to be as vibrant and green. And we know that we're fast, we're running fast, racing fast in a direction that's just not sustainable. And so I do believe that there has to be some limits that are placed on us. And I don't think it's a problem. I think we have a responsibility to be good stewards of the one planet <laughs> that we are living on. And that it's not, I don't, I don't feel like it's a, a true trade-off. Um, the fact of the matter is the majority of people are living in squalor, while a small minority of us largely in the West, and you know, a few spottings of us in, in different parts of the world are living opulently, right? Living really great. You know, we have these lights, we have this, and I'm, you know, I'm grateful for this ability for us to you know, broadcast and do all that we're doing here. But the fact is, the majority of the world isn't this, right? And we might you know, confuse ourselves or, or you know, let, allow ourselves to think that this is what is happening most of the time, but it's not. And the fact is, more people can't partake because the disparities are so wide. <laughs> and a few have a lot of access and the majority have 
a lot, a lot less access, right? And so to me, it's about harmony. It's about balance. It's about recalibrating ourselves. And it's about just the health and viability of ourselves as, human, and as humans, as a human species, but also just the world. And I don't think it's a problem. I, I find myself really perplexed when there's this like resistance or aversion to moderation, right? Like it's even like eating, right? Just you don't eat too much, you don't eat to excess. We shouldn't at least. Of course we do and people are faced with all sorts of health challenges as a result, but that's exactly it. You have health challenges as a result of engaging in excess. And so we need to start thinking about, I think humanity, about the planet, as almost like the human body. Like, are we able to overwork or overengage one part without, you know, with the neglect to the other? Um, or do we need something that's a bit more harmonious and allows for the entire being, the entire mechanism, the organism to be well functioning, to be healthy, and to thrive? And you that rebalancing is yeah. imperative. You know it's not the 1960s anymore when the young people are advocating moderation. I know, right? <laughs> um, we're like doing intermittent fasting. We're doing like OMAD, one meal a day. Yeah, we're doing all sorts of stuff. Exactly. How do you feel, Vanessa, about that trade-off between individual liberties and um, safeguarding the planet? Well, I think that there is, a, there is a place for individual responsibility when it comes to addressing the climate crisis. And for me, when it comes to individual responsibility, I think it's really about understanding the different privileges that uh, we all carry. Because, for example, you know, I could give an example. Um, you know, someone, um, let me say in Europe, may say that we all need to become vegans for the climate. But when you go to certain communities in Africa, you may find that the source of food is, let me say, milk from the cows that are being, you know, red at home. Yeah. You may find that, um, I mean, what I'm trying to say is that, you know, what may pass off as what we need to all do to address the climate crisis may mean that a certain community will not have access to food or access to, you know, what to drink. So I think when it comes to individual responsibility, it's a place of understanding privilege mm -hmm. and understanding cultures as well, you know, respecting <laughs> cultures um, of many, you know, communities, not just in African Uh, African countries, uh, but also different indigenous communities. So for me, the place of uh, individual responsibility, you understand your privilege and you do something about it. But then um, there is also, you know, the, the, the much bigger responsibility that, you know, maybe the government kind of responsibility. You find that many people have We are in a kind of system that, you know, may not allow people to live as sustainable as they want. And it may be because of, you know, they can't access public transportation, they can't access, you know, the things that would allow them to live more sustainably. I think it, there is also a huge responsibility on our governments to create systems. The kind of system that we afford ourselves in is a system that is heavily, you know, dependent on fossil fuels. So there is a need to massively and you know, quickly scale up a transition to renewable energy because even the system itself, you know, may not allow, <coughs> excuse me, people to live um, as sustainably as possible. Again, you may say that, um, you know, a country, let me say, in Africa again, that people need to do this and that, but they may not have the same public transportation, like we see, for example, in Europe. So again, I think it goes back to understanding privilege, and it goes back to, you know, the roles of corporations and our governments in, you know, addressing the climate crisis and, you know, scaling up renewables, especially in countries that are, 
um, ex suffering with energy poverty right now. I think um, I think that's how I would that's what I would say about it. Mm -hmm. yeah. What is interesting, I think, is your appeal to individual responsibility or to moderation doesn't sound like, you know, we need a very strong government telling everybody what to do, but we actually need to get people engaged bottom up to change behaviors and to change expectations. Is that a fair summary or? For, for me? Yeah. No. No. Okay. No, no, no. I, I do believe that there are uh, people and agencies that have larger degree of power and influence and who could do more at scale. Um, I, I, I believe in both, of course. I think oftentimes folks are inspired by the individuals who are taking action, but those individuals are saying, hey, this is not enough. I can't single-handedly stop global warming. I can't, even in my small community or neighborhood or city, I'm not going to change what's going on on scale, right? And so corporations, governments, they're the ones who do have the power, the scale of, of influence. They're the ones who are making large decisions that do impact our lives. Um, there are a lot of decisions that we think are decisions for us as an individual that are being predetermined <laughs> before we even get the options that are handed out to us. So um, I 100% believe in you know, everything that, I don't want to conflate the two because I think Vanessa was making a very nuanced observation and, and set of you know, critiques around culture and, and um, a diversity in terms of approach because different strategies need to be employed in different parts of the world. But uh, I think we should not get confused about the role of, of governments and corporations, tra specifically transnational corporations, right. that have undue influence and say over how, um, how we even get to live our lives. And, so and let's stay yeah. there for a second. So you, you advise companies also as part of what you do. Um, diversity is obviously a big issue because diversity of thought is supposed to help drive companies to the right issues. Um, in my own experience, I can tell you I've seen boards that were, you know, four women, four men. So it happened they all went to the same schools and went to the same rotaries and stuff like that. There wasn't a lot of diversity of thought in there. So how do you get proper diversity of thought and proper, you know, for companies to start thinking about these issues and changing the way they approach them? Oh, well, I, I think depending on the sector, you know, you take a few different approaches, but the, the most important thing is that commitment, is to understanding that in order to have a society or even a business that meets the challenges of our day, it's going to require a multiplicity of thought. It's going to require that diversity in thinking because if we want to be innovating, if we want to be changing, if we want to be progressing in the right way, <laughs> if we want to be going in the right direction, it's going to require that we have various ways of thinking, of doing, of different modalities that inform our decision making. And what I've been finding is that there's been this... Um, there's been this new thing where folks are, you know, they're, they're open, they're interested in diversity, there's um, an appetite for it, especially with the movement and all that it's invited people into. Uh, however, what I've also noted is that while there have been these new diversity, equity, and inclusion um, initiatives, oftentimes what happens is either they don't get fully funded and resourced in the ways that the you know, businesses really need and what they really need to do. Um, they may have made a kind of a superficial or a, some kind of symbolic gesture or made a statement or say some kind of verbal commitment, but following up with substantive action, real measures, has been hard, right? And so what we do need is more accountability at the back end and behind the scenes and when the doors close and, you know, when the cameras are gone and the, all of that is away, we, we need the actual follow-up to happen. And in addition to that, what I found when people are engaging in this, you know, diversity hiring and, and so on, what oftentimes happens is that people may be hiring or becoming more inclusive and more diverse at the intern level or a junior level, but not necessarily at Board. the executive or C-suite yeah. level, right? Yeah. And that has been um, kind of disturbing, <laughs> to be quite honest. <laughs> it's been really disturbing. And the people who have the power, the real decision makers and the influencers within um, an organization are oftentimes 
uh, you know, not as willing <laughs> to share the room or share the space with other people of color, those people with uh, diversity of thought. And what I'm encouraging folks to do is to see it through, because what has been shown is that as we invite and as we include various voices in those rooms, we do see the innovation, we do see the progress, we do see cutting edge solutions emerge, and we see that it's also good for your bottom line. Right. And that to me has been one of the most mind blowing and fascinating things and compelling reasons, but for some reason there's still this little bit of resistance that is, that is going on. So I've been you know, consulting and working with different groups and companies to um, guide them on this path. Yeah. Thank you. At this point, um, we have some time left. I'd love to invite you to ask questions. Please go ahead. Hi, my name is Alejandro Gonzalez. I am from Mexico. So in 2022, the BLF movement went through um, co corruption allegations and mismanagement of funds allegations. So my question is, as many of these movements are grassroots based and they don't have like the infrastructure of the capacity of like big organizations, how can we ensure transparency and accountability when it comes to receiving funds from the public to create trust in the kind of work that you do? Thank you for that question. I think that's a very important question. Um, yeah, back in 22, we were, we were definitely hit with a lot of questions and challenges and a lot of, <laughs> it, was, it was a lot. Um, and the reality is those types of questions and allegations come up with social movements, period. That's been happening since way before me. This is a way in which um, oftentimes the right will try to undermine or distract from the main conversation and the main set of issues that need to be addressed in the society. So we, as a movement, have, are no, you know, we're, we're also privy to that, right? We're, we're not going to be uh, outside of that kind of critique, just like our elders and mentors and ancestors went through similar sets of challenges. Um, and of course, we're living in a day and age where we're like, transparency is everything, and we have data, and we have phones, and we have all this access. Uh, what we did with Black Lives Matter was quite literally develop a website that lists everything, <laughs> all the information on the spending, all the information on um, the receipts, everything is there, and quite literally created this transparency reporting center so that everyone can know exactly what took place and what is continuing to take place. And that was just the best way that we felt was possible to address those concerns. Um, but we know some people see it and they're, you know, they will follow up and actually go to the website and a lot of people won't. And oftentimes what happens is like you get these salacious news headlines and, you know, the one-off reporting and, you know, set of trolls that are like harping on this issue. And oftentimes you don't get the other side <laughs> and the follow-up and they're like, hey, let's go back and actually look at the data and the reports and, and follow up. And so sadly, I feel like that happened. Um, however, we're still, we're still going, we're still strong, and the work is needed now more than ever, and it continues, sadly, sadly continues to be needed. I mean, I, I don't know if some of you all have seen what happened in New York just a couple days ago when a young um, dehoused brother was also strangled to death on the subway train. <sighs> Sorry, I just said that out loud, and it just... Um, yeah, it's just, it's hard to see that these things happen so often, so routinely. And um, yeah, the work is just, it just continues to be needed. And uh, yeah, it's hard, to, it's hard to even have to be the one to discuss those types of things. And sometimes I catch myself as I say it and I'm like, it hits me in a deeper way. And I'm just like, this person was living and now they're not. And now they're a hashtag. And like they didn't wake up thinking that that was going to be their lives. Um, so yeah, it's, the work is needed. Thankfully, there are people who continue to volunteer. There are people who continue to give and donate and coalitions that are being made. And I've been encouraging folks to go you know, look at the Transparency Center, 
you know, go get involved directly with organizations, get involved so you know exactly what's happening. Um, and there's no, there's, there's no amount of work that is too small. <laughs> like, we need literally every hand on deck. Um, we're trying to build multiracial democracies that work for everybody, and that's going to require a lot of resources, a lot of support. And it's not just one organization, it's literally hundreds, if not thousands of organizations that are doing the work um, beyond like a BLM or you know, any of the organizations' names that you even know. Thank you, Ayo. Yeah. Any more? I'll take one more question over there, please. Yeah. Yes, my name is Alvin from Kenya. Thank you so much, Vanessa, and Ayo for the good work you're doing. So my question goes first to Vanessa. Uh, you will remember in 2004, the first African Nobel Prize winner, that was Professor Wangari Madai, an environmental activist. One of the challenges she faced during her time was the lack of a framework that guarantees the right for demonstration, picketing, and you know, mass action. Because I believe as an activist, you really require a legal framework that's <clears throat> sorry, that protects the right of demonstration and picketing and all that. So looking at the Ugandan framework, the legal framework specifically, the constitution does not come out clearly on the protection of the right of demonstration. So what challenges must you have faced with the, you know, with the state authorities, with the government in the cause of advancing the environmental justice? Okay, finally to Ayo, now my question is, you know, you're speaking of Black Lives Matter, yes, I do agree. But what about the other Asian indigenous communities? Because I think it's a very broad scope. And what are you doing so that it's not like it's a war against the black versus the white? Because I've also seen the white who have also died in African hands, and I believe that's also injustice. So what are we doing so that it's like an awareness that every race has to respect you know, the other race in line with the, the convention on elimination of all forms of discrimination? So that it's not really a war of, you know, the white and the black, but it's sort of a, a global awareness of the need to respect, you know, just everyone regardless of the color, so that it's sort of bringing in an, an aspect of intergenerational link. Because I know of a lot of environmental activists who are white, some were killed in Kenya. So how do we do it? How do we do the, the, the campaign in a manner that it does not paint a picture of two races fighting or rather two you know, I get to think you get what I'm saying. So what steps are you putting in so that it's sort of a balance? Because I believe if it goes to the extremist, then it will be sort of the black against the white. And that will still pull us to the dark ages. Thank okay. you. Thank you for your questions. I'm going to have to ask you for <laughs> relatively short answers because we're reaching the end. Okay, Vanessa, go first. Okay, yeah, well, for me and the different activists in Uganda, of course, it was hard and it's still hard for us to organize, um, you know, big or, you know, mass events or even marches. So what we've done with that is to actually go into communities and also go into schools to carry out climate education and organize within the communities and also organize within the schools and also greatly use social media to create awareness about uh, the challenges that Uganda and Africa faces when it comes to the climate crisis. Um, okay, so quickly. <laughs> Oh my gosh, the class. So to be clear, uh, we're, we're working on building multiracial democracies that work for everybody. And I know for a fact that uh, we're not creating some kind of war, you know, black versus white, that's quite, what we're asking for and what we're demanding and what we're working towards is something that is healthy and functional. And in order to do something that's healthy and functional, you also have to be honest around the disparities that are occurring. And so we don't mince our words when we talk about Black Lives Matter. We don't mince our words when we talk about, you know, racism is affecting us and is quite literally killing us. And we don't mince our words around the reports and the data and the stories that we say, the overwhelming uh, uh, amount of stories that we're seeing that illustrate the fact that in our societies and, and quite literally around the world, Black people are devalued and dehumanized and treated as though we were disposable, right? And this is a fact. This is 
on the continent of Africa, but this is all around the world. And I think we have to be honest about that. I do not want to uh, say something, you know, uh, you all have heard this, but like in All Lives Matter, like we know that everybody's life matters. Like I know that. That is exactly why I had to create Black Lives Matter because in our world, in our societies, we see that black people's lives have not mattered, right? They are treated as though they mattered. And so I live in the real world. We all live in the real world. And in the theoretical world, we can say things like an all lives matter, but in the real world, we have to talk about the real issues and the real consequences and the impact that our skin color has made on our lives and the, and the quality of our lives. So um, I appreciate the point that was made and you know, raising that concern. Uh, there are a lot of communities that have been so deeply inspired by our movements that have been working you know, hand in hand with us, which is phenomenal, allies and supporters, but also communities who've said, hey, you know what, something else is happening in my community. I now found the courage to get involved and to speak up because we saw you do it. And that's what should be happening. People should feel inspired to do what's right, to do what's just, and to fight for justice for their communities, and to join alongside us and do that work together. This work isn't about one community worse than another. This is about harmony along all, <laughs> harmony in the world and making it effective. And it's, it's been really powerful to see that the Black Lives Matter movement is in fact a multiracial movement for Black lives. Let's be 100% clear, that is literally what it is. And there are some rallies and protests that we've seen that it, there were barely any black people, but there were a sea of white folks, our allies, supporters, you know, folks from Asia, folks from around the world, and it's phenomenal and it's powerful because they understand the reality of what we're faced with, and they're saying, you know, enough is enough. I don't want my neighbor treated like this. I don't want my colleague treated like this. I, you know, enough is enough. I'm facing the reality, and I'm committed to transforming our society. Thank you. With these inspiring final words, I hope you feel inspired to maybe also bring IO to some of your organizations to talk and to work with to uh, pursue these goals. Um, I'd also like to plug Vanessa has actually written a book um, which is called The Bigger Picture, The Threat of Climate Change to People of East Africa. So if you want to read up more on that, I can highly recommend that. <laughs> and thank you to both for a really engaging and really interesting panel. Thank you. Thank you.